friends and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Marnie and I talk about true crime, mystery, all that kind of spooky stuff. I'm gonna be honest, you guys thought I was dead, didn't you? <laughs> I'm alive! I kind of got really busy and kind of pushed this channel to the side. I'm so <laughs> sorry. For the long break it just it is what it is you know life just be like that sometimes but uh i'm back today i'm going to talk about a case that i actually saw on my twitter timeline i saw one of my followers tweet this article and the headline really grabbed me when i read about it i was just baffled it was the most interesting case so i really wanted to cover it as my comeback video <laughs> There's sort of a weird twist in this story, so I'm not going to give an overview, I'm just going to get straight into it. Today I'm going to be talking about Matthew Taylor Coleman. Matthew Coleman was a normal guy, he was born in Santa Barbara in 1981. His mother was an artist and his dad owned a small business, they were quite a normal family. And Matthew lived near the coast and he learned to love the ocean really young. He spent time as a kid sailing, surfing and spearfishing off the California coast which sounds so fun. How fun does growing up in California sound? Later on in life, when he grew up a little bit more, Matthew earned a BA from San Loma University while also competing on the San Loma National Championship surf team. So he was good at surfing and good in the ocean. He then taught English in San Sebastian, which was a high school in Spain, and he taught English to the kids there. After two years of traveling and teaching the high school in Spain and working with surfing students, he's gotta put some surfing in there somewhere, Matthew came back to Santa Barbara to earn a master's degree in Spanish. And his evangelical faith pushed him to give back to the community. In 2011, Matthew founded the Love Water Surf School, a Christian surf camp and it became known as the number one surf school in Santa Barbara. So he was doing really well. Active in the Christian surf community for years, a student of Matthew's in the early 2010s described him as a typical Santa Barbara water guy, a sportsman, a spearfisher and a surfer. He said he was always cheerful and upbeat, sometimes to the point where it was a little upsetting and a bit annoying. He was known as an evangelical Christian and someone who frequently preached about what was right and wrong and he was very much seen as a moral compass in this sort of little surf community. And Matthew showed no real signs of ever being enticed or involved in crime of any sort, which is really what makes this story and what happened after so confusing and so chilling. On August the 7th, Matthew's wife Abby called Santa Barbara police. She said that while she and her husband Matthew were packing for a camping trip, he suddenly took their two children, 10 month old Roxy and two year old Kaleo, got in their Mercedes van and just drove off. They hadn't been arguing and they didn't have any noticeable or notable marital stress recently. So, Abby wasn't that worried. She was a bit confused, but she wasn't uber concerned. One of her main concerns was that she knew the Mercedes van didn't have a child's car seat inside. So she was more concerned about the safety of her children inside the car without the right materials. Matthew wasn't answering any of Abby's texts, but Abby said to the police that she believed her kids were in no real danger and that Matthew would never harm the children. She said he would come back to their home eventually, but she wanted to put the warning out there in case any of the police found him. And Matthew wasn't just ignoring Abby when he drove away. He wasn't replying to any of his friends or family members, phone calls or texts. Now when Abby called the police, they suggested that maybe she use the Find My iPhone app. And this worked really well. It located Matthew almost immediately. The Find My iPhone app located Matthew in Pabellon Rosita, which is a Mexican town in the state of Baja, California. Why was Matthew in Mexico? Well, Mexican police located CCTV photos of Matthew checking into a hotel with the kids the day of his disappearance. On August 9th, Matthew can be seen leaving the hotel in the early morning with his two kids, and he later returned 
alone. When the FBI located their Mexican liaison and it described the two children, they reported that two infants matching the description had been located at approximately 8am that morning. A ranch hand had noticed blood outside of his home and experienced such a shock when his dog led him to two small bodies. He notified his manager immediately to call the police to come and investigate. He said that he was scared and sad because these are tiny children that just don't know any better. When Matthew tried to return, the authorities pulled him in for extra screening. They discovered blood on his car's registration papers and he was immediately arrested. What the hell happened? Matthew appeared to the local community and his friends and family around him to be an adoring and loving father. In July, an anonymous surf instructor said that he'd been stood on the beach with Matthew as they watched the surfing students. The two men spoke about being dads and life in general, and the anonymous source said that he seemed his usual cheerful self speaking in terms of love and God, and of getting to teach his son how to stand on a surfboard. But Matthew seemed to have run off the rails for some reason. After his arrest, Matthew told federal authorities that he had been receiving visions and signs that his wife, Abby, possessed serpent DNA and that she had passed it on to their children. He said that he'd been enlightened by QAnon and Illuminati conspiracy theorists and that he believed he had to save the world from monsters. He believed that with the serpent DNA his children would grow up into monsters so he had to get rid of them and obsessed with the certainty of the serpent DNA that he believed his children harboured. He drove his two children out to Rancho del Cielo near Rosarita about 30 miles from Tijuana. There he stabbed 10 month old Roxy with a spear gun 12 times killing her with a direct hit to her heart and Kaleo was also killed with the same gun. Afterwards, Matthew said that he moved his children's bodies back to the brush, then drove two miles and ditched the bloody clothes and the spear gun near a creek. He said that he deposited more bloody clothes and a child's blanket in a blue trash can located near Tijuana. He was taken to Santa Ana jail the day after the murder, after seeking re-entry into the US. And that's when Mexican authorities found the murder weapon, the bloody clothes and the children's blanket. So what had Matthew believing this absurd theory that his children were monsters harboring serpent DNA. In short, the internet. QAnon is a bizarre conspiracy theory that began on 4chan. It alleges that celebrities and the Hollywood elite worship Satan, engage in paedophilia, child murder, and blood drinking rituals in order to maintain their beautiful youth. It's a potent blend of classic anti-Semitic tropes and contemporary right-wing politics was supercharged by the coronavirus pandemic when it started in 2020. And there it merged with other conspiracy communities, including the anti-vaccine and anti-lockdown groups and the proponents of false allegations of election fraud in the 2020 presidential race in the US. QAnon has been repeatedly linked to both political and interpersonal violence, including several cases of parents allegedly kidnapping their children. And this isn't the first time that police have responded to a crime that was linked to QAnon. In 2016, Edgar Madison Welch entered a Washington DC pizzeria and fired a rifle into the door. He was claiming that he was investigating the now debunked Pizzagate rumour. This conspiracy theory, I'm sure everybody's heard of, claimed that the Comet Ping Pong restaurant was the hub of a satanic child sex abuse ring associated with top democratic politicians. It's absolutely nuts. Edgar Welch was later sentenced to four years in prison and the FBI has long warned of QAnon's potential to inspire violence. The agency noted that the fact that the conspiracy theories many predictions had not come true created a feeling of obligation 
among adherents to engage in violence and it seems to be a pattern that we do see emerging. But to the best of our knowledge, Matthew wasn't involved in paedophilia or blood drinking rituals. He seemed most concerned about cleansing the world from monsters, not becoming one. It is believed that the serpent DNA that Matthew refers to comes from an older conspiracy theory, which falsely asserts that many powerful people are actually cold-blooded humanoid reptilians who have the power to shapeshift into human form. There are plenty of YouTube videos about this theory, proving certain people are lizard people. I'm sure you've probably seen one. I've seen a few myself. One that sticks out in my mind is the one of Justin Bieber at his deposition when he got arrested quite a few years ago. In the recording, the camera sort of glitches and it looks like his eyes flicker and he has two eyelids like lizards do. It went viral back in the day and I remember being young and thinking, what does this mean? But it had a lot of people talking about how Justin Bieber had become so popular and in influential, that he had been recruited to join the lizard people and, you know, the elite. The theory falsely purports that reptilian aliens secretly run the world and have taken over important positions in society. Reptilian humanoids or humans that are part reptile are commonly found in science fiction and fantasy writing. But the claim that lizard people control the world is a fringe conspiracy theory that was popularised in the late 1990s and has actually been thriving ever since. Contemporary belief in reptilians is most recently linked to British conspiracy theorist David Ick, who published his first book, The Biggest Secret, in 1998. He alleged that the same in connecting bloodlines have controlled the planet for thousands of years and suggests that the blood drinking reptilians of extraterrestrial origin have been controlling the world for centuries and even originated the Illuminati. For lizard people believers, there are 12 million of them currently in the US. Mark Andre Argentino, a PhD candidate, at Concordia University researching extremism explained that the reptilian theory acts as an explainer for all of the evil that has befallen this world. It's somebody to blame and that's why people tend to fall into this theory. And I think there's something to be said about the choice of animal used in this theory too. The serpent or the snake is one of the oldest and most common mythological symbols and has become associated with evil. In the biblical story of Adam and Eve, the serpent who tempts them to eat the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden is popularly equated with the devil. So I think it is interesting to note that while the theory suggests that people in power are reptilian, the mind can connect the dots almost automatically by associating reptiles with evil. And hence, we get this theory about lizard people that want to do harm to us normal people. Well, back to the case. On August the 11th, Matthew was charged with the foreign murder of a US national, a crime that required the US Attorney General to approve and retained no possibility of bail. In October of last year, Matthew pleaded not guilty in a US district court in San Diego, but the investigation continued. In November of last year, the FBI seized all of Matthew's electronic devices. They wanted to go through his browser history and all of his messages. In a joint motion filed by the US Attorney and the Federal Public Defenders, both sides asked for the investigation to be continued until May so that they could carry on gathering evidence in the case. FBI agents are particularly interested in digging into Matthew's online engagement on groups and message boards that talk about QAnon conspiracy theories. They want to see what Matthew wrote about his beliefs and whether they may have had any influence over his actions. If convicted, Matthew could be eligible for the death penalty. And if the Attorney General decides against the death penalty, Matthew's maximum sentence could be life in prison and a $250,000 fine. Until his next trial appearance, the date we still don't know of, Matthew has been held in protective custody so that he doesn't interact with other cellmates 
and apparently all he has with him is a Bible. In December, news came out that Matthew had penned a jailhouse letter to a close friend, reflecting on his mistakes and pondering the possibilities of redemption. The anonymous source said that Matthew had begged for forgiveness, but that he understands that he's now where he deserves to be. Because this close friend has decided to stay anonymous, and I could only find this little story about the letter in very shady sources like the Daily Mail and The Sun. The validity of these claims and what Matthew potentially thinks about his crimes now can't be confirmed. But it is interesting to ponder. And that's all we know about this crime so far. Matthew's wife, Abby, obviously remains devastated. A family friend says that she is confused and destroyed inside. She never had any ideas that Matthew thought all of these crazy theories and she thinks that maybe he just snapped. But members of Santa Barbara's surfing community and people close to the Coleman family had heard rumours that Matthew and his wife Abby had been researching QAnon and Illuminati theories over the past year. Apparently Matthew would bring it up around his friends and say just how crazy it all sounded, but also how it kind of made sense. It is a red flag if I ever heard one. Patrick Woods, a surfer in Matthew's area said, I've surfed with him a couple of times and I've never had any problems with him. He seemed cool, he seemed like he had it together. He seemed all there mentally. Definitely not someone to travel somewhere and murder his kids. It's a total mind bender, he said. And I think that is the perfect quote to end this on because I totally agree. Hopefully we will find out some more as the trial continues. I have no doubt with the evidence that we have that Matthew will be found guilty and sentenced to, at the least, imprisonment. But I do wonder on what grounds he is arguing a not guilty defence. Part of me wonders whether his lawyers will advise him to go down the route of not guilty by way of insanity, because this case is crazy. But then I suppose that would come down to whether Matthew really believes that he would be willing to forego his public sanity to argue a not guilty defence. The only information we have right now is that Matthew has pleaded not guilty, but we don't know the grounds, so maybe that will come out later on. Anyway, please let me know what you think about this case. I love conspiracy theories, so this one was really interesting to me. I've read all these conspiracy theories, but <laughs> never would I believe them and act on them in such a heinous way. If you have any thoughts or have heard of these theories or maybe you think what might have been going through Matthew's head, please do leave a comment in the comments box below. I'd love to have a chat with you guys about this case and if you like you can also let me know of any other cases that you might like me to cover in future videos. I am not going to commit to weekly or bi-weekly videos because by this point we all know that's not going to happen. <laughs> I am going to be making more videos at some point in the foreseeable future. Thank you for watching, I love you, thank you for sticking around and I will see you in the next one, hopefully not in six months. <laughs> okay, bye!